Okay, I'm going to start with recording now. Uh, I would like to welcome you to the last computational genetics discussion group this year. And we're going to continue with CGG ne next year, uh, probably end of January or uh, first week of uh, February, the, depending on the speakers. So the, the today's speaker is Daniel Tolhurst. He's originally a biometrician from Australia with string links to Australian grains industry and fisheries. And now he's a PhD student in quantitative genetics and genomics at the Roslyn Institute within the Highlander lab. And his primary interest is uh, in developing the efficient linear mixed models for plant breeding applications. So with this, Daniel, uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Ivan, and I recall some of it. And thank you for the introduction. That's probably some of the stuff I wrote on the website a couple of years ago now. And I was just trying to remember when I actually wrote that. But yes, uh, originally from Australia and now here at Rosalind the last two years in my PhD. And essentially the work that I'll be sharing or presenting today will be part of that PhD. Uh, and so today I'll be talking about genomic prediction into future growing environments using known and unknown environmental covariates. I'll sort of elaborate exactly what that means in a moment, but we're down sort of in the field of crop farming, improving world food security and that sort of thing. And it's all about, you know, how are we going to be able to do that in an ever-changing climate, ever-changing environments when we're growing our, our crops? So maybe if I can work out how to go to the next slide, that would be good. Uh, I'd just like to start off before I even begin the presentation with just some acknowledgements and some thank you to Bayer Crop Science and the Highlander Lab. This work is a joint collaboration between those two groups. Uh, it is my PhD research as well, but under Dr. Gregor Gorchank, Chris Gaynor, John Hickey, Brian Gardinia, and thank you to Bayer for the data and, and the studentship or the scholarship. Finally, I'd like to thank some of my previous supervisors, although they're not involved in this research, uh, it's really stemmed from the research that we were doing in the University of Wollongong there uh, prior to me joining this Roslyn group. So it is the continuation of Professor Cullison and Dr. Smith's research, or an, maybe an extension of that. So just a brief outline of today's talk. Obviously, we'll have an introduction and some motivation to why, why we're doing this research. I'm going to explain or detail the Bayer Crop Science Cotton Breeding Program that's given, provided a lot of motivation to this research. Uh, we're going to outline some selection measures, so how plant breeders can actually use information from genomic prediction models to actually make efficient selections, because it's all well and good providing lots of predictions, lots of information, but if they can't actually use it in a concise manner, then it doesn't really, well, it defeats the purpose of it. And we're going to touch on how we can obtain some forward predictions into future growing environments with the models that we'll be presenting today. So I guess we'll start off with an introduction or a motivation to all this. Uh, I mean, one way of going about this is to put up the breeders equation and say that, well, if we want to increase genetic gain, then there's a number of different elements that we, we can uh, improve. and probably the most important that in biometrics or, or genomic prediction models are involved in increasing the accuracy of our predictions and also if we can uh, decrease the generation interval. Now I'm going to not really touch on the decrease in generation interval but rather how we're going to increase accuracy of these predictions. So the other way of going about it is to say well in order to to increase genetic gain and increase the accuracy of a prediction, what do we mean? Well, it's because of this genotype by environment interaction. Uh, that reflects how different genotypes or, or what breeding lines, how they change in their performance or their response in different environments. So if we're talking in terms of a, a yield trait, for instance, it's how will that different lines change in their yield when they're placed in different environments? Some may favor harsh environments, say, while others may not. Uh, others may do really well in really good environments, but poorly in poor environments. So how can we actually predict 
how a genotype will perform depending on the environment. And so that's why I've put up here, it's becoming increasingly important amid climate change because what's happening is the environments from year to year are becoming more different. And it's beginning, becoming harder and harder to predict how these genotypes will respond to the different environments because the environments themselves are becoming harder to predict. So that's sort of one introduction to this research. The next sort of motivation is that a lot of these models that involve G by E interaction or, or at least accommodate G, G by E interaction produce a large number of, or a large amount of information. So what we get is essentially a prediction for every genotype by environment combination. So if we have say in a breeding program, a thousand genotypes and 20 environments, we're going to have 20,000 different records or, or BLUPs, what we call these predictions. So it makes it harder for plant breeders to make those efficient selections. So really what we want to be able to do is also summarize this information. Uh, so breeders can actually use this summaries to make their efficient selections. And they may be measures of performance. So yield performance, how high does uh, a genotype perform and how stable is that response? So does it change a lot over different environments or does it say the same constant or is it stable? over those different environments. So that's sort of the second part to, to what we need to consider. So the motivation to this particular research or this presentation is based on these factor analytic selection tools uh, that Alison Smith and Brian Cullis presented in 2018. And I'll have a reference later on for that particular paper, but what they do is they provide measures of overall performance and stability uh, across different environments. Now I'm going to go into this in a bit more in a second with these different graphics, but if those are familiar with the old Finlay Wilkinson regression, they're sort of improved versions of them because they use these factor analytic models, uh, which are basically uh, multiple regressions uh, that are estimated from the data. I will be going to those with more details later on, but for now, essentially what it is is able to get out summaries out of these models. Uh, and that's based on the different types of G by E that we observe. So if we just have a look at the plots here, on the y-axis, we're just gonna think of it as the predicted trait value. So it may be yield, for instance. On the x-axis, we have two environments, E1 and E2. What's plotted on these graphics here are two genotype responses, G1 and G2. So in this first plot, we can see that the lines are parallel and therefore there's no actual G by E interaction. So what's happening is the increase from E1 to E2 is just a change in the mean. And this is what is usually captured in models with genotype main effects or, or intercepts. Differing to that is what we call scale G by E interaction. And in this case, what we can see is that the difference between the response in E1 to the difference between the response in E2 has a change or relative change in scale because the, the values are, are obviously, the difference between them in E2 is much larger. Now that's what we call scale G by E because what's happened is we haven't got a crossing over just yet. And that's the third type, or actually, sorry, the second type of G by E interaction is what we call crossover G by E. So what this means is that in E1, genotype G1 is better performing, but in E2, genotype G2 is better performing. So why is this important? Well, it's important because when we wanna get measures of overall performance and stability, we don't want to be averaging over, crossing over of G by E in terms of performance. What we wanna do is actually look at the scale G by E. So what happens here is that if we just take the average value for the, between the two environments for G1 and the average value between the two environments for G2, we get a measure of overall performance for those two genotypes. And we can't, can quite clearly see that G1 is better performing than G2. In terms of how stable something is, then yes, we do wanna actually account for or summarize the crossing over of, of, the info, uh, of the performance. And so in this case, what we do is we just take the deviations from zero to the regression line and same here, and that gives us a measure of how stable it is. In this particular case, we will actually get the same measure for the two, for the two genotypes. 
what we have to be aware of is that it's not giving us any information about how those genotypes are specifically adapted to the two environments. Because obviously in E2, with regards to this final plot, we would want to be choosing G2, not G1. And in E1, we want to be picking e, uh, G1, not G2. So what we can actually do with those information is we put it in this sort of scatter plot. And what we're plotting here is the overall performance versus the stability. And we have G1 is much higher than G2, but in this particular case or this data set, there are better genotypes because they were going to be occur at the top left of this figure. They're going to have a high overall performance and they're going to have a low RMSD value so that they're constantly high performing. And that's really what a breeder is after in terms of making his selections or through to um, variety release. So that's sort of covering the background information to the problem. Uh, but what's really, what I've found that the limitation of these particular selection tools are th threefold. Uh, they do assume that you can select for broad adaptation across all environments. So it, it, what that means is that there is some level of scale G by E in your data set. So you can pick that best performing line across everything. Uh, that might not be the case when you have multiple TPE or multiple target population of environments in your data set. Uh, they're not directly interpretable since factor analytic models are actually based on hypothetical or unknown covariates. Uh, and you cannot use these to predict the response uh, into future growing environments because again, they're just based on observed G by E effects, not predictable G by E effects because of the unknown covariates that are underlying these models. So I guess that leads us to the three research objectives or the three uh, outcomes that we would like to actually fulfill. Uh, and that is have selection measures for multiple TPE. We want to include known environmental covariates that may be daily temperature, soil moisture, uh, humidity, all these sorts of different covariates so that they, we can actually interpret the model or the measures themselves. And the third place is that we want to be able to actually use these measures to predict into future growing environments with the ever-changing GBE, with climate change and et cetera, et cetera. And what we're going to do with this is actually apply it to a Bayer Crop Science cotton breeding program. So with that in mind, we'll just kick off with some brief details of the cotton breeding program. Uh, nothing too strenuous here, just that it does follow a typical eight year cycle uh, from initial crossing to variety leach, uh, release. And what happens within that eight years is multiple stages. Uh, and what we're really interested in in this research or when we're talking about sort of genomic prediction is the stages of field evaluation where there's actual formal trials being grown in the field. And each of those trials have a number of plots and those plots contain different lines or genotypes in them. Now, if we were to have five stages of field evaluation, which I've got here in this, in this little graphic here, and the reason why I've started with 2018 is actually because that's the data set that I'll be looking at in a moment. But essentially, if I want to look at the 2018 set of lines, I've got stage one, stage two, stage three, stage fours, and stage fives. And what's happened is in stage five in 2018, they actually originated from 2014. What's going on here through the green lines is that there's been some selection pressure applied and they're selecting individuals to go to progress through based on several traits of, of interest. Uh, the most uh, the trait of primary interest in cotton is seed cotton yield, and that's what I'll be focusing on in, on in this talk. But what also can happen is that genotypes may not actually be, be progressed, but they may actually be retained for a following year and then they may progress. So that's what the red lines across occur and, th and that's something that does happen in, in plant breeding programs. Uh, the amount of lines that get retained is, is based on essentially how conservative the program is. Uh, they might be very conservative so, so rather than throwing out the lines they, they retain them uh, or they may be not conservative and, and just go for things that they want to progress that they know are well and we don't need to give it an extra year of trialing. What also is happening here is that the number of genotypes as you go down the page will decrease simply because you're making those selections, but the number of environments in which the genotypes are being tested will increase. 
And so it's sort of the in, inversely proportional sort of thing that's going on here. So essentially, when you get to the latter stages, you are testing your, your genotypes in a large amount, a range of different environments. So, oops, sorry. So what I will be look, focusing on in the remainder of this talk is the selection that goes from S3 in 2017 to the S4 in, in 2018. Now we have phenotypic data for both of these, these cohorts, but what I'll be mostly interested in is training a model with the S3 data in 2017 and predicting the phenotypes in the uh, 2018 environments. So that's what I'll be talking about here. In this cotton breeding program, there are three major regions, so three major TPE. So what I was talking about before is important that we're able to get measures that are uh, relevant to these three different regions. We have the Western region, which is Texas. We have the Southern region, which is sort of the, if you can follow my cursor, this sort of area around here. And then we have a Northern region with the triangles. Now, what we'll find is that actually, we also have these three sort of bands uh, in the east, the, the mid and the west as well. So that's quite interesting itself. They seem to be uh, cutting off north and south due to a latitude sort of range. Uh, but again, there's sort of this definitely an overlap between all of these different environments in the, in the east of the, US, uh, of, of the US. So our training set that we have in S3 in 2017 has 208 genotypes and 24 environments. So it's, it's a relatively small data set, but it's enough to sort of a proof of concept to show what's going on with these models. In 2018, based on the selections that were made, those 208 genotypes went down to 55 genotypes. So they're taking about a quarter of the lines. Number of environments did decrease in this case, but typically they would increase the number of environments. Uh, there was also other things going on within Bayer, which has caused the change in number of environments that's going on there. And that's what I'm going to call the test set. So that's 55 and 20. Just to show the difference in the regions, that, as I was saying before, first thing here that we what I was showing here is the genetic correlations. So that shows basically how similar different environments are based on a correlation. A correlation of one simply means that the ranking of genotypes is exactly the same in those two environments. A, a correlation of negative one means that they're perfect disagreement or, or the opposite ranking. And the somewhere in the middle is zero where there's a lot of dissimilarity in the rankings. So the first point of notable here is that the North and the South do show, exhibit a correlation not only within those regions, but across those two regions as well. So again, that reinforces the fact before, as I was saying, is that there is a lot of overlap going on here with this Eastern side of the US. The other thing that is very obvious as well is that the West is correlated within the West in different environments, but there's no correlation with the North and the South. So you may say based on this plot alone, well, then why would you wanna put you know, the data together, why do we want to actually model all these three different regions? Well, the simple answer is the fact that uh, this is only one year's worth of data. So although that there is dissimilarity between the North, the South and the West in this one years, adding extra years will actually decrease that amount of dissimilarity because what we do observe is that there will be environments in the West correlated with environments in the North and the South in different years. So that's one reason why. Another reason why we put this data together is because this is the first time you're able to actually see this dissimilarity between the North, the South and the West in, because you do need to put the data together to be able to do that as well. So it is providing information regardless. But for the point of what we wanna show is that we can put it together and still get out our measures of selection that are appropriate for these different regions. So the training set in 2017, has a range of phenotypic data, as I was mentioning, in the north uh, here with the, the triangles, the south with the circles, and the, and the west with the x's. Now, the main thing to really take from this is simply that there is a structure to this data set. There are 24 environments. We have three trials in each environment, and that's quite a common thing in plant breeding. They're typically actually managed in smaller trials 
and they are all located within the same field essentially but they're like having different blocks and so for management it makes it more uh, easier to accomplish that they are randomized complete block designs with about two replicates of each genotype and they have about 208 genotypes, well not about, sorry, we have 208 genotypes in total. And that C cotton yield is that trait of interest. And that's essentially just what this whole table is really summarizing. Also in the fact that we can see that the, the yields differ according to different regions and the heritabilities do differ not only within regions, but across those regions as well. The environmental information that we have collected, or rather Bay has collected, is based on 18 covariates. So we have latitude and longitude coordinates for each of the different environments. And we also have a range of other covariates ob obtained from daily weather observations. So we have things like cloud cover, humidity, uh, precipitation, temperature. We also have some soil co based covariates as well. And again, the main thing to see here is that these do differ across the different regions. That's one thing, but what really we were interested in is how these different covariates are driving the different GYE in these different regions. And that's something that we'll be exploring in a moment as well. And just to, fi uh, to finalize what we, uh, other information we have in this, in this training set is the marker data, of course. Uh, and we have 204 of the genotypes with marker data. So those 204 genotypes become the training set, essentially. We have SNPs based on 36,000 uh, markers. And what we do is just filter those based on minor and little frequency and missing values. Now, this isn't too pertinent to the, to the research. This is just basically, we do have marker data and we do construct a genomic relationship matrix by Van Radden 1 in that. Uh, that's again, not, this is secondary sort of information to how the, the research is applied. Moving to the linear mix model. Now, the next few slides are a bit statsy, so I'll try my best just to sort of summarize the most important points. Uh, we have a linear mix model as given here. So we have our vectors of, of fixed effects, which is tall, and it has a design matrix, which connects the, the yields or the phenotypes in the field to the different fixed effects. The typical fixed effects that we're gonna be fitting is the overall mean and means for every environment as well as fixed. The U here is our genetic effects or our random genotype by environment effects. And that again has a design matrix there. We'll come back to what the U is and how we model the U in a moment. Our UP is a vector of non-genetic effects, the random non-genetic effects with design matrix ZP. Most of the effects that we're fitting in UP include the design structure, so blocking effects. There may also be other effects due to spatial modeling, spatial variation, may have some harvest effects and that sort of thing in the random part there that are non-genetic. And finally, we have the vector of residuals. And typically what we apply to the vector of residuals is a variance matrix, which enables spatial modeling. So typically it's a two-dimensional AL1, AL1 process that we applied to that. But now what we're really interested in is, okay, given that linear mix model, what can we do with our genetic effects or our genotype by environment effects in different environments? And what we have here again is we have one effect for every genotype in every environment. So we have NG by N, NE combinations essentially. So we have a large amount of effects or information there. So, Typically what we would do, or at least in, in the research that I've been interesting, interested in is what we call factor analytic models. And what these factor analytic models are, well, they have, have an analogy to a random regression, uh, a multiple regression, but instead of actually having a series of covariates that you may have, it previously I mentioned we have uh, soil moisture, humidity, temperature, what the factor analytic model does is actually estimate a an, an number of unknown covariates or hypothetical covariates, which are based on the data set. So in this case, what we can have a look at is the form of the factor analytic model. And again, it's a bit complex in this form, but I'll just go through essentially what each component is doing. So the lambdas here in the first instance 
are a vector of covariates that are, that are estimated from the, from the data. And that's for factor one. What the Fs then are a vector of slopes. So if you're thinking of that random regression, we have the lambdas would be on the x-axis and the Fs would be the slopes of the different regression lines. And essentially what we do is we have each of those combinations for a number of different factors, factor two, all the way up to factor K. And so the more factors that we fit, essentially the more amount of uh, variance that we're explaining with that. On top of that, what we have is also a lack of fit effect or residuals uh, or genetic residuals, which are not a part of the regression, but rather they're separate components. And again, I'll go through what this sort of means in sort of the graphical sense as well. But that's what, what it really is, the, the FA model, what it's doing there. We're getting some part that has a, a regression or a latent regression, and we have some lack of fit or residual at the end of it. Now, in terms of what that means for a variance matrix of our effects is that we have two components chronicled together. The first component is coming from the regression side of things. And the second component is coming from the lack of fit or the residual side of things. And so what this matrix here is, it's a parsimonious approximation or, or rather alternative to a fully unstructured matrix. And that unstructured matrix would have a variance for every environment and then a covariance between every pair of environments. And that's really what we wanna do with the FA model is we wanna have some parsimonious alternative to that. And what's really neat is that I've called this first part the common variance matrix is because that is gathering information across environments based on those regressions. This second part is the specific variance matrix because it's uncorrelated across environments. So you're only getting information in here. Oh, I've lost my cursor. You're only getting information in here from the effects within specific environments, individual environments. So this left hand side is where I would say, okay, that is modeling repeatable G by E. And then the right-hand side, it's uh, modeling non-repeatable G by E. And the final component there is obviously the genomic relationship matrix. And that's how you get the full structure between genotypes in, in same environments, as well as genotypes in different environments and so on and so forth. So that's all well and good, but it has a limitation, as I said, that that the loadings in that case were estimated from the data. And that's the conventional or the original traditional FA model. What we really wanna be able to do is, well, how can we get information into this model based on the environment, environmental covariates that are measured, based on those temperatures, based on those humidities, based on that soil moisture. And the way that we do that is that we re-specify the loadings matrix in two components. The left-hand component is based on the known environmental covariates. So that is information coming from temperature, moisture, humidity. The right-hand component is the information that is left over, not coming from those known environmental covariates. So they are actually coming from unknown covariates. So the, the addition of this first term here is actually makes this whole thing become interpretable and also predictable in terms of how we can actually predict into future environments. And it's just a re-specification of the original model. Uh, and it's, it's a bit like saying, okay, we have a factory link model. We have a random regression model where we're actually training the, the loadings or the, these, these lambdas rather with known information. And so that's actually, you know, including that more, that information in there is beneficial. So that sort of wraps up the methods in a nutshell. It's, it's an extension of factor learning model. It's an extension of a random regression model that it has known covariates and it has unknown covariates. And one of the main things here that we've got is actually that we enable these two components to be orthogonal to each other. And what that means is simply that as much information as we can capture in the covariates themselves will be captured and then the remaining information will be orthogonal to that. So it's not actually uh, impeding that first lot of information. It's not, it's not competing for information. So with that in mind, we've got some results here based on these two models. 
So on the left-hand side in these tables is a series of models that would be the conventional models that you're fitting to the data set. So we have a simple diagonal model that assumes that the effects in different environments are independent. We have a compound symmetry model. That is quite, a, I would say, a popular method among plant breeding programs because it gives you a main effect overall and breeders like to interpret that. But as I mentioned before, that compound symmetry model in the main effect does not actually capture G by E. Uh, we also have a random aggression model. So that's just a simple random aggression model on the covariates themselves. So it doesn't have unknown covariates in the model, just known covariates. And the FA series of FAs and that is based on the unknown covariates as well. So what we could see here is when we fit fact analytic models, we do increase the number of factors until we have a point in which the amount of variance explained is desirable. So the first fact analytic model fits about 43%, followed by 60%, followed by 70%, 75.2, and then 79. And you can obviously keep going, but you have to stop at a point that you are essentially comfortable or confident that you're no longer, you're not actually capturing noise in that model. So if you were to fit all 100%, then you would definitely be capturing noise. You're not actually getting it benefiting from the latent regression. Uh, and in this case, we stopped at 75%, so an FA4. The right-hand side here is the, the new integrated factor only model. So this includes both known and unknown covariates. So, what you can see here is that the one dash one means that we're fitting one factor to the known portion and one factor to the unknown portion. And then two dash one, well, we're fitting two factors to the unknown portion and one factor the, to the known uh, to the known portion. Uh, sorry, the unknown portion. And and again, you keep doing that until you stop at a, a position where you're happy with the amount of variance which is being explained. Uh, and again, in this point, we we stop at about seventy five percent. The other measure here is explained how much of the variance is being explained by the known covariates. So how, how much are we benefiting from having those uh, temperatures, moistures, humidity measures in the model? And so again, we can see here that we continue to increase to a point where we stopped at about 35%, uh, after which, we're not getting any much, we're not drawing any more information out of those covariates. So that's a sort of the stopping point that's going on there. Okay, so once we've fitted these models, well, what do we do with them? Uh, okay, and now what we can do is get those selection measures from these different models. So the first one that we get here are measures of overall performance and stability based on a conventional factor analytic model. In that, it was 75% variance explained. So if I go back, we're talking about summarizing the information from this model here. So on the, on the x-axis here, we have those loadings or those lambdas that I was talking about before. These lines here are the regression lines. So those are the Fs. And those regression lines are for two genotypes, G1 and G5. And then on... The y-axis there is that we basically we have the blobs or the, the predicted effects. So what we can see is a regression line and the different deviations around that regression line. So those different deviations coming from the regression line are based on the higher order factors. So this is just factor one that we're showing here. We also have factor two, factor three, and factor four behind that. And so those different factors are causing the deviations that are going on there. So if we recall back to the start of the presentation, I mentioned about what we do want to do is we want to summarize uh, scale G by E when we're getting measures of overall performance. And that's because the regression lines don't intersect. So as we can see here, those two regressions line never intersect. And that will be the same for any pair of genotypes in the 208 in the data set. So that means that we can get a measure of overall performance here. And what we've just taken is the average value of the regression line at the at the average lambda value. So that's why we get those two G1 there and G5. So if I go on to the right hand slide, which is the, the scatter plot of the overall performance, we can see that the G1 here matches exactly across there and the G5 here matches exactly across there. 
Now, what we also want to do is we want to summarize the deviations around that regression line. And so what we essentially take is the root mean square of those deviations or the variance essentially of those deviations. And that's why G1 is off to the right more than G5 is because you can see the deviations around this regression line are much smaller than the deviations around that regression line. And that's also a bit of an analogy to the finlay wilkins regression or at least the Shuckler type stability variance uh, from, from those original models or those joint regression models. Now, the 44% and the 31% here is because that the overall performance captures 44% of the variance and the stability measures capture about 31% of the variance. So what this is telling me is that when we're making these selections based on the conventional factor analytic model is that the amount of broad adaptation or rather the amount of variance in the measures for broad adaptation is not all that much more than the amount of variance in the measures for specific adaptation. So that is OP and RMSD. Uh, but what we'd really like to do is, okay, that's fine for all different, the three TPEs, but what, how can we make this better in terms of just the individual TPEs? And that's what we do with our, with our new model, or rather, before I even get there, we have to remember what the three objectives uh, TPEs, which I mentioned, we want to make sure they're directly interpretable and we want to be obtained forward predictions. So the first case is how do we get the measures for multiple TPE? Uh, and we do that based on the regressions for each of the different regions or TPE separately. So we do in a nice little uh, rotation of those. And what that means is in the north, we now have the amount of information or rather the amount of variance in selecting for broad adaptation has jumped up to 77%. So it's no longer at 44%, but rather that's because the amount of scale GBE in the North alone is much higher than the amount of scale GBE in all of the regions. And that makes sense because within that region, you do expect uh, more scale than crossover GBE. Uh, and so we can do that for the South as well. And so it's, jumped up to 57% in the OP. And we can also do that for the West, which has jumped up to 66%. Now, the important part also is that if we have a look at G1 and G2 in the North, we can clearly see that G1 is, well, we think it's a bit better in terms of its performance because it is higher up. Uh, in the South, they are, are sitting bang on each other. So in the South, whoops, sorry. So in the south, you would choose either one of those two. But in the north, you would choose G1 over G2. Now that's important because if I go back to the original one, in when we're looking at the measures over all regions, we see that G1 is off to the right. So we're saying it's, it's unstable. But really it's because it's doing well in certain regions. And that information isn't being depicted here rather than just sort of summarizing and saying it's unstable, but it is because it's doing really well in particular regions. So again, if I now say, what about the West then? Well, I can clearly see G1 is the most favorable genotype in the West by a long shot. So again, we didn't see that from that initial plot of all regions until we actually disentangled the different regions. So that's really important. And also there are different ranking changes going on in each of these different regions, which are getting masked by that overall performance for across regions. So that sort of, that covers our first uh, objective, okay? That we've got measures for multiple TPE. Our second objective is, okay, how can we use these now to interpret the measures? And because we have environmental covariates in our uh, model, then we can actually start getting some interpretation from these. So firstly, if we look at the north, we can see on the left-hand side with the selection measures that I was just presenting, but on the right-hand side, I've summarized the amount of variance that is being explained by each of the different covariates. And what we're seeing is that humidity and temperature and soil temperature are becoming uh, quite significant covariates for that OP measure for factor one, because that OP measure is based on that first factor. All remaining uh, factors, which are the stability measure, well, there's nothing really sort of coming out much except for longitude, but it's 
that first step of getting actually information or interpretability into what they're selecting for, what would the breeder be actually selecting on? So that gives the interpretation to these measures. And again, I can do that for each of the different regions separately. And we can see how sort of humidity and temperature sort of comes out significant each time and humidity in this last instance. So again, we're getting now interpretation into what those uh, measures actually mean, or rather what are the covariates driving the GBAE underlying those measures. So that, that ticks off the box for number two. The third uh, sort of objective was, okay, well, how can we predict into future? Oops, sorry, somebody got a question. How are we actually able to predict into future environments? Uh, okay, so, well, basically, because we have environmental covariates uh, for the current year, and you may have environmental covariates measured or at least estimated for the next year, then you can use those new covariates to actually obtain your forward predictions, essentially. And so that's what we've done here. So again, we're talking, talking about using the training set and the model that we fitted to the 2017 data and predicting 55 genotypes in the following year. The important part about the map now is that we can see that not all of the trials in successive years are grown at the same location. There are some which are overlapping, uh, but there are completely you know, separate trials as well. So it's not like we're just getting uh, predictions for the same location every time, just in a new year. So we're not doing that. We, we are getting new locations as well. So there's that complexity there. And so really the, the final thing is essentially that we can uh, obtain predictions. So the first half of this table on the left-hand side is the predictions for the genotypes in environments in the north, the south, uh, the north plus the south separate uh, together as, and then the west and then all together. So what that means, just looking at the left-hand table is if we were to use a simple compound symmetry model and when we get the main effect out of that model, then we can pretty well estimate or rather predict the genotypes in the north and in the, and in the south, but not really the west. And that really showing how diverse the environments are from year to year uh, and how much GBI you're getting in the West from year to year. Uh, if we then use a random regression model, that simple random regression model, again, we're doing well in the North, better in the South, uh, but when it comes to the, to the West, we're only getting about 0.25 correlation. The new model that we're proposing here is doing well in both the North and the South, uh, but then it also does a bit better in the West. And so again, what we're really looking at here is actually improving this correlation as well, because that's still quite low. And we, we are looking at different feature selection techniques to actually improve that, as well as the underlying linear mix model that we have there. But what is really encouraging is if we look at the right-hand side of this table, is if we actually try to predict the mean line of the phenotypes, uh, rather, sorry, rather the genotypes. So that is again, how well on average are the genotypes performing in the 2018 set? And can we actually predict that based on the 2017 training set? And what's quite interesting is that the correlations are quite high for the North and the South for both the compound symmetry model and the random regression model, but they are shocking for, for the West. So again, they're getting the wrong main effect. Well, they're getting the opposite uh, correlations. Uh, but our model's done really well in, in the north and the south. And then in the west, we've got an improvement of by 0.8. Uh, so we are able to actually predict the main effect or the mean line in that uh, western region quite well. So that does give uh, obviously some confidence in what's going on here. But ultimately what we are, again, as I mentioned, focusing on is improving this to above 0.5 and so on. Uh, most things here will be related to, you know, the size of the training set. We only have one year's worth of data in this particular training set. So typically we would include multiple years, uh, more genotypes, you know, you would have much larger, more appropriate um, training set. But again, it was quite uh, good to see even with such a small data set that it was doing quite well with that. Uh, and that brings me basically to the end of the presentation. So conclusion, you know, it's a good example how we can leverage environmental covariate information, but it's also a good example how we can leverage known and unknown covariates, essentially, and how we can actually estimate some of those covariates from the data, 
uh, and how we can actually use that for selection. We have that model which has an appropriate model for experimental design, non-genetic variation. I didn't really speak about it, but it is a single step model. So it has all the information in a one go. Uh, so we're not losing or, or being inefficient in any manner there. Uh, we also getting that interpretable model for G by E and that we can use that to predict uh, genotypes into future environments. And the preprint there is also available. Uh, it's been submitted to TAG, so it's currently under review. And we have a couple of references there, but I'll leave it on the final slide. And I'm happy to take any questions in the last 10 minutes or so. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Daniel, for a very nice talk. Um, we already had some questions uh, from Leticia yeah. in, in chat. Um, you, you may open the chat just to see yourself, yeah. but basically Leticia would like to know how do you decide uh, What's the good number of factors in your factor analytic model? Yeah. Uh, no worries. So, so and, and then yeah. just just to read the after that there are comments from uh, Tiago and Gregor uh, about no which criterion you're using. So please yeah. comment on that. No worries. Yeah. So uh, how how do you decide when to stop? In, yep. Okay, that's fine. Uh, and then Tiago said it's using BIC. Okay, and that was a, at least for him. No, no. He uses both Pearson and Prop. Yes. So I think I think Gregor has really yeah, answered it there. It's basically, uh, and I sort of, the, the people in, in the Highlander lab will know when I speak about these models before, is that essentially at the moment, there's no real hard hard rule, or, you know, rule of thumb that you can use to when you're stopping in these things. Uh, mostly it actually comes from experience in knowing the data set and, and how much of the variation you can explain based on those latent regressions. Uh, the AIC and BIC, well, the AIC tends to overfit and the BIC tends to underfit. Um, so they're likelihood-based measures with, you know, obviously a penalty in there. Uh, the variance proportion accounted for, you can, like I said, you can keep going higher order and, and, and sort of gain more, more variance, more variance, more variance. Uh, but if I was to plot the values of the variance accounted for, I would actually get steep rises, steep rises, and eventually they would plateau off. So you would be increasing the orders of factors, but not gaining much in the number of uh, amount of variance explained. So essentially what I wanted to do is was choose the model at a, at a sufficient amount of variance explained before it hits that plateau. And, and that is essentially using all three measures. Um, so yeah, that's not, there's not, like I said, there's, there's not really a hard and fast rule at the moment. Uh, but I believe the, well, I'm not actually sure, but I thought maybe the my previous group in Australia might have been working on that. But then again, I'm not sure. So, yeah, Raphael, and then there's a, yeah. oh, okay, please go ahead. Yeah, so Raphael said, for forward predictions, you gave correlations, I presumed. Did you look at the regression line? How good is your collaboration? Uh, so, so that's one thing. Yes, I have provided correlations here, just basically inserting the new correlations in and, and obtaining uh, predictions and then correlating those with the phenotypes. I haven't looked at collaborating these just yet, and that's something I would actually like to look at. So that's it. <laughs> so I haven't I haven't looked at looking at a, a validation set just yet. Uh, Daniel and another one in chat from yep. Ivan. Yeah. Uh, okay. So the difference between phenotypes and the average mean prediction. Uh, well. All of these correlations are based on the phenotypes that we have phenotypes that we have in 2018. Uh, but on the left hand side is essentially if I want to predict into the environments in 2018, what is the correlation of my predictions? Uh, and so, for instance, in the north, I have five environments in the north. So what's the correlation of predicting the uh, the um, using the model into each of those five environments separately? The mean line is basically saying that, okay, 
if I was looking at the average phenotype across those five environments in the north, what is the best genotype in terms of that prediction? Uh, and that's why we're getting much better uh, predictions for the average mean line, basically, than we would get into specific environments. Uh, so again, we're looking in the West, we're getting a good uh, prediction of the best uh, genotype overall across all environments in the West, uh, but we don't do a, such a good job at individual environments in the West because they are so different. And, and again, that's something we're looking at improving. Okay, we still have some few minutes for some questions, so please go ahead, either type in chat. Uh, you know, I, I don't know, maybe I can ask just a short question. So, Daniel, this is, do you see any opportunity or, or big challenge of implementing factor analytic model in, in Kind of animal breeding setting where we have perhaps quite difference uh, in what we record and how we record our data sets uh, just a short comment no no that's okay uh i believe karen meyer has done a lot of work in that space uh and so probably wouldn't do her justice if i try to explain exactly the nuances with animal breeding but i'm sure any of karen meyer's papers on the area would would show how you can handle it and basically you you can it's just yes it is a different data structure but you're essentially just modeling the genetic effects uh and and it, the fa model in this sense it sits within the lineamics model so yes we can handle uh design effects and spatial and all the rest of it but the fa model that is you know modeling different genetic effects uh is what you're after in in animal settings so again any of karen meyer's references for animal breeding would be would be the the way to go Cool. Thank you. And if you open chat, please, uh, another comment from Tiago here. Uh, why you did not choose to look at the likelihood ratio test between nested models? Uh, again, they, they seem um, tend to overfit these sorts of things. So again, it's just a, it's been, it has been done, it has been looked at, all those sorts of things. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Uh, I mean, we still have five more minutes, uh, so just shoot, 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 shoot out any questions you have. Uh, oh, another comment in in chat uh, from Yon this time. If 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 you want to read that and yeah, yeah, I was just writing down one of. I was just writing down Raphael's question just so I can look at it later. Uh, what are the next steps in your work? How quick do you think this would be applicable in, say, Bayer breeding program with complete data? How does your current work compare with other more conventional models using covariates? Okay, so I guess the what are the next steps in your work? Well, the, the harder thing I see that in implementing these sorts of things is actually how the data is sitting in different breeding programs, whether they have good uh, databases and all the rest of it. Now, I'm not gonna comment on what the state of Bayer's is, but that's one issue. The next issue is actually being able to run these in real time, you know, in actually being able to fit these models and, and get predictions and get summaries and all the rest of it in, in, a, in a time that actually enables the breeders to make their selections, you know, before it's too late, essentially. There are, are a quick turnaround between harvest and selection and you know planting and all the rest of it. So next steps are really, well, how can we make these more efficient? How can we actually implement these things in terms of a framework within a breeding program so they can do this routinely is, is one of the, um, one of the uh, major next steps. The application to say Bay breeding program, well, once we do similar, simulations or rather these aren't simulated data sorry once we do similar uh forward predictions for a larger data sets more more genotypes and we're happy with that bayer will be implementing these sorts of models or at least they're very keen on doing so if they can do that how does your current work compare with other more conventional models using covariates uh again uh, i did show some of the random regression model here that's probably one of the 
other main conventional models uh, that we're using. There's a few others that we will be testing against uh, in the coming sort of next year or so. There's a couple of papers that have been put out. Um, the, the reaction norm model from, from Yarkin's group, well, I think that this one will do quite well, well, much better than that, because basically they create the environmental relationship matrix based on the covariates, which is fine, but they don't have any feature selection in there. So all, all different covariates uh, contribute to the same amount. Whereas at least in ours, we do have that um, different variances associated with the different covariance. So again, that's that sort of work on current research there on of how it competes to other stuff. One of the reviewers come back and actually suggested a different paper. And, and so we'll be comparing it to that as well. Um, they thought that, that, that this particular paper is quite good. So we'll see if we can, do, we can beat them and then go from there. And thank you, Daniel, for really nice talk. It was nice to have, have you as a last participant or speaker at CDGG for this year. And I would like to thank all the participants uh, for being with us. I wish everybody happy holidays and successful new year. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me as the last presenter. It, yeah. <laughs>